All right. Last week, we talked about um, this new commandment. We talked about John th uh, chapter 13. We are actually looking at the chapter John, uh, chapters 12 through 17 in John, as we're getting ready for Palm Sunday and Easter, specifically because those are the last things that Jesus did and said before he went through his crucifixion. And we've talked about that. If you're about, if you know you're going to get killed, and you have people that you need to pass your organization onto, <laughs> or your mission and your ministry, you probably want them to get the most important things. And we believe that John is the one who records these. So at the end of chapter 13, we read that a new commandment, not as in new because you've never heard it before, but fresh, a new way, a new commandment I give to you, says Jesus, to his disciples, that you love one another as I have loved you. And he had just washed their feet, which was a shocking, very upsetting experience for them because that just didn't happen in that culture. And masters didn't wash their uh, d uh, disciples or, or uh, students' feet. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So that's kind of where we left the scene. And today, we continue to listen to Jesus' last words to his disciples. And we find it in John chapter 14. Of course, they didn't have that written down, but we do. And basically... Jesus is going to assure them. He starts with uh, some verses that often get read at funerals, and I certainly have read them at memorials. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Because can you imagine? They thought he was going to stay, that they were going to be co-rulers with him, and he's saying, I'm leaving you. And their whole lives are crumbling around them. These three years that they've sacrificed to follow him and given up everything. Of course their hearts are troubled. So he's, let not your heart be troubled. But what he's really saying is, stop being troubled. Because it's kind of like, don't, you know, don't be afraid. Well, too late. I'm already afraid. <laughs> so all I have the choice to do now is to stop being afraid. And he's basically saying, stop being troubled. Set your heart firmly on this, what I'm going to tell you. You believe in God, he says to them. Believe also in me. He's been with them and he's saying, believe in God, but believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. It really means many dwellings, many rooms, many places. If it were not so, I would have told you, as in I would have told you right now. I wouldn't trick you. And then he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He says, I go. He knows that he's going to the cross. He knows he's going to die. But it's not happening to him. He is choosing. I go of my own free will. Nobody is you know, having power over me. I go to prepare a place for you. He knows that's via the cross. And some of you remember that we've talked about the whole metaphor of the Jewish wedding. And that in, the, in those days, they would get married. Betrothal was really being married, but it just wasn't consummated. And so the, the betrothed, the wife would stay at her father's house, and the husband would go back to his father's house to prepare a room to build a room, an, an addition to the house. And when it was ready, he would come back for his bride. Then they'd go home, consummate the marriage, and after that, they had the party. And that's what Jesus is saying. This is what he's talking about to them. He's saying, I am going back to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And when it's ready, when it's the perfect time, and guess what? I don't know when that's going to be. He doesn't say all that, but that's the truth. And um, only the Father knows. Then I'll come back and come get you. 
So they would hear this in the context of their culture, and we kind of need to add all those words because we don't have that same context. So because the ultimate peace for, not, for troubled hearts is to be where Jesus is. And I will come and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. So they're completely confused already, right? He's going to leave, and he's saying, you know where I'm going, and you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas, you know, we say that he's doubting Thomas. He's really just honest Thomas. He asks the question that everybody else is thinking. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? It's a little bit like some of our experience with ways. <laughs> some of you don't have a good relationship with your Waze app, and it doesn't always send you to where you are hoping to go. And so they're like, we don't even know where you're going, so how can we map that out? But he says... I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the way. That's the way home to the Father. Now, big deal here is in the Gospel of John, there's eight times that Jesus says in Greek, ego, eimi, which means I, I am. It's redundant. You wouldn't say that in that language, just like we wouldn't say I, I am. You know, it's like, are you stuttering? No. I am the way. This is one of those places. Ego a me, which means he is saying, I am. You remember what Jehovah, Jehovah God, his father God's name is? I am who I am. So Jesus is very clearly saying, I am God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes through the, to the father except through me. That's not popular in our culture. We want to believe that we can make our own way to God, that there is ult ultimate all sorts of different ways. Jesus himself claims something different, and it's open to everyone. But this is what he says. Show us the Father. That's what they're going to say. So he says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And another of his disciples, they're very comfort comfortable with him. And they just say what they think. They're not like, oh, it's a teacher. We don't want to ask him a dumb question. They don't get it. They just say, huh? And in this case, he, they're saying, Lord, show us the Father. And it is sufficient for us because they now know he's leaving. So maybe if you just show us the Father, that'll help us deal with this whole trauma we are now in. And Jesus said to them, have I been with you so long and yet have you not known me, Philip? Remember, he's just said, ego a me. I am. He's already said, I am. Right? The Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. So not only does Jesus not speak his own words, everything he's done, all those miracles, are only because the Father is doing it through them. It's really no different for us. We can't do any of it on our own. And believe you me, when I'm up here, and those who or part of the journey of me getting ready, know very well that I have no idea what's going to happen until it happens, because that's how God still wants to do it. And Jesus continued, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe for the sake of the works themselves. So you can believe my words, or you can believe everything you've seen. And they've seen some spectacular stuff, right? So Jesus assures them, besides this, he assures them, and he's going to assure them with three different promises. And the first is this in John 14, 12. Most assuredly, you can take this to the bank, people. I say to you, he or she who believes in me, the works that I do, he or she will also do. Wow. They must think, they thought he was leaving, they were going to be left alone, and it was over. And what is he saying to them? Yes, I'm leaving, but what you've seen me do, you're going to do the same stuff. 
and greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. And because you won't be doing this alone. You won't be doing what I've been doing alone. So greater works, okay, so there's this whole controversy, and there's a whole group of Christians who want to believe that we're going to do even more spectacular miracles than Jesus was doing. I don't know. Lots of people walking on water these days, you know what I mean? <laughs> like calming storms. I, it's not quantitatively different, as in it's not bigger and better. It's not Texas or whatever. It's not bigger and better than everything Jesus has done. It is just more of it. But he, on earth, was located in one space. Now, his people are everywhere. So these same, same things are happening. And it is said that during Jesus' time, when he was actually on earth, far fewer people believed in him than immediately after his departure. In Acts, 3,000 and then another, you know, 5,000 in total in a very span, short span of time come to know him. That didn't happen during his lifetime. So they did far more than he was even doing, and that's what he's saying to them. And then he says, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, there is a catch. This doesn't mean anything. I know it says anything, and he's not lying, but it doesn't mean anything you feel like he's going to do for you. He is not the genie where you rub the bottle, and you just conjure up a wish, and boom, poof. Jesus will deliver. That's not what this says. Because it comes right after, if you believe in me, the works that I do, you will also do. And you'll do even greater than this. And whatever you ask in my name, in my character, according to my will, and in light of all the things that I want you to do on earth, you ask me for help with that, you can take that to the bank. I'll do it. I'll do it. And some of us have seen that, right? You've prayed for something according to God's will, and he delivers. Sometimes not the next day. Sometimes we have to wait a, a bit, but he delivers. And then he continues, this is love. Okay, I'll have to turn two pages. Hang on. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. In Jesus' economy, love is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's not the thing that happens maybe when we're singing and we're just transported and we just feel the love, which is great. You can have that. But Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper. And helper so that you can do these works, so that you can become more like Jesus, so you can do the greater things that he said, so that you can love, so that you can keep commandments, because none of us can do that on our own. That he may abide with you forever, as in stay. See, Jesus is going, right? But he's promising someone else, another helper, meaning another one just like me is coming, and he's going to stay. You can count on that you can have someone. The spirit of truth whom the word cannot, world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. But he will be with you and dwell with you. I will not leave you as orphans. And that's a big deal because orphans had no rights and were in danger. So those are number two and three. I promise another helper and I will not leave you as orphans. You're not going to be alone. You're going to have another Lord and Master. Because here's the thing. When a teacher left, the disciples, you know, a rabbi left his disciples, those were considered orphans. So he said it in their context. And those were then without a guide, without a father figure for them. So... A little while longer and the world will not see me anymore, he says, but you will see me because I live, you will also live. And that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. I mean, is this, I mean, the reason I'm reading you the entire text is because there's nothing in there that I can skip. I cannot tell you a story about this as much as I would like to. It is too important. This is like the things he's wanted to tell them all along. There's only 11 of them right now. Judas is gone. He can finally 
tell them the rest of the story because the betrayer, the traitor is no longer in their midst. And he's telling them the truth. And he's saying, I am in my father. So the father and him are one and they are in us. If we love Jesus and accept him, it is mind blowing. The God of the universe wants to live in us and be in our lives. And we get to be in his life. I don't understand it. I've been at this for 40 years. I can't claim that I understand this, but this is the truth. And it's a lifetime of discovery. We'll get it when we get to heaven. Or maybe then even not, but we won't care. He who has my commandments and keeps them. It's all good to have a Bible and carry it around. I have God's commandments. You know, people have Bibles on their shelves and there's dust in them and on them. <laughs> that alone is not enough. You have to actually keep him, he says. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Loving Jesus means doing what he said. That's his litmus test. Now, rest assured, that doesn't mean you have to do it perfectly. I had that little moment of checking my spirit last night going, oh, well, later he says, if you obey me, you are my friends. I'm thinking, ah, I mess up a lot. <laughs> Maybe I'm still in the servant stage, not the friend stage. But Jesus doesn't ask for perfect obedience because we can't do it. We're sinners. It's the heart. It's Judas, and it's not Iscariot. Yes, he's gone. Said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not of the world? They still don't have any idea of what he's saying. Okay, so you're leaving. How is it that we will see you and they can't see you? I mean, this is confusing. What are you saying? And Jesus answered and said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. So we're getting some clues, right? Keeping commandments. Where can we find them? In the word. You have to keep the words that he's saying. And my father will love him and he will come to him and, make, and we will make our home with him. The same word used for many mansions at the very beginning of this chapter is the same word here. Dwelling. That, that place in heaven that I'm preparing for you. My father, if you love me and keep my commandments and keep my word, my father and I will come and live with you right now. We'll make our house with you right now. It's all mind-blowing if you really think about it. And he who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you hear are not my own, but by the Father who sent me. And then he tells him that he's going to send us another helper, and it's the spirit of peace. And he says, basically, peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Now, that was a normal greeting, like goodbye. Actually, I just read, and I probably knew this, but I'd forgotten. Goodbye really means God be with you. Did you know that that's where goodbye came from? I found that an interesting little tidbit of information. But he's saying, I'm not giving you peace like the world gives. He says again, let not your heart be troubled, troubled and neither be afraid. Is that not a good word for us today? Don't let your heart be troubled. I am with you. I am. I am. Jesus, Father God, I'm with you. And I've sent you my Holy Spirit. If you believe in me, you've got all that power. Don't be afraid. My peace that transcends all understanding, I will live, live with you. And now I've told you so that before it comes, he says, um, before it happens, I've told you so that when it happens, you won't be scared. And then he says, I love the Father. And as the Father gave me command, so I do. Again, he is not, this is not happening to Jesus. It's not out of control. He is going and he is obeying the Father because he knows to redeem the world, to have everybody be able to have access to the Father requires, he chooses to go to the cross. And he just said, love means obeying my commandments. And he's saying, just like that, I love the Father, the Father loves me, and I obey his commands. And part of that is going to die. And then he says, let's go. <laughs> Rise, let's go from here. It seems so abrupt after all that. And then we get into the next part of this. And he says, I, there's lots of question as to whether actually left. I think people want to believe they were still in the room because the rest of this, how can you have that conversation on the way? But I think they had conversations on the way all the time. And in Israel, there's lots of vines. And he's now talking about vines. He says, I am the true vine. Because see, in the Old Testament, Israel was the vine. 
and the Lord, Father God was the, the vine dresser or the Lord of the vineyard. And now Jesus says, I'm the vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, the Father, takes away. And every branch that bear, bears fruit, he prunes or he cleans. So you have choices. First of all, a vine. If Jesus is the vine and we are the branches... Have you ever seen a loose branch do very well on its own, a loose vine branch? When you cut off the blackberry branch in your, in your yard and you leave it laying there, does it keep producing blackberries very well? Doesn't, does it? <laughs> so I'm the vine, you're the branches. A branch that does not bear fruit, as in a dead branch, he takes away, or he, he might, they say, or it might be lifted up. Like what they would do is some branch would get on the ground and it wouldn't get enough light and they would pick it up and string them up to give them a chance to grow some fruit. If they still didn't grow fruit, probably. But there's a chance. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. So when trouble comes your way, when it seems like God is against you, there's a good chance he's just doing some cleaning up. Any fruit tree or any bush that produces fruit that doesn't get pruned doesn't get much good fruit. might get lots of fruit, but it might be sour or tiny or doesn't ripen. But I don't know if you, any of you have had a fruit tree that you've pruned. What happens after, a couple of years after? You get an explosion of fruit. Oh my goodness. And so that's what God obviously knows since he made the stuff. That it may bear more fruit. You are already clean. See, you've already been pruned because the words which I've spoken to you. These disciples had already listened and heard and believed. And then he says this, abide in me and I in you. Abide in me, you live in me, and I in you. It's relational. This is not a religion we're about. It is a relationship with a living God, and he wants that, and it means staying. Stay. Stay put. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself, as we talked, neither can you unless you abide in me. This is the clue. Without Jesus, we can't do it, and Jesus wants them to really get it, and you know what does it happen in the Bible when they want us to really get it? We repeat it again and again. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him or her, you know, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You read that? Without me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing for the kingdom. You can do stuff. I mean, you can tie your shoes. You can, you know, go to work. You can drive a car. I mean, you can do things. That's not what it's saying. But if you want to be a fruit-bearing branch... It ain't happening without the vine. You cannot do it on your own. And it's interesting, I've told you before, that oftentimes people get to speak about God's word, get to try it out ahead of time. Oh my goodness, this whole, these slides have been challenging anyway. But yesterday, I just, I, I couldn't, I didn't even have my brain around any of this. I felt so overwhelmed. I didn't know how it was going to go or what I was going to say or what it was going to look like. And I had read it, and so the whole time it's like, without you, I can do nothing. Without you, I can do nothing. If you don't do it, it isn't going to happen. I woke up multiple times in the night, because that happens, you know, when you're restless, and it just kept, that refrain was in my head, and it was just so interesting, because like, Jesus, if you don't show up, nothing's going to happen. If you don't show me, I can't do it. And it was just interesting how I... Because I was pretty uh, frazzled feeling last night. I kept moving forward and working on it. It wasn't that I just sat and felt frazzled. But I didn't feel any sense of this is right or yes, we're getting there. But the more I was praying, without you, it can do nothing. If you don't show up, it's not going to happen. Just the calm that came. Because I can't do it. I can't do anything. I can't help you. I mean, sorry. I mean, I know I have a pastor title. Uh, but I can't help you. I really can't, <laughs> unless I am plugged into the vine, because then it's Jesus helping you, and maybe he uses me as his instrument, but I have got nothing. Apart from Jesus, I can do nothing, and apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. So it's good, and it's our ultimate good to abide in Jesus, and he continues, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, 
ask what you desire and it will be done for you. How is that possible? When you abide in him and he in you, you want what he wants. Then you can ask him that because you already want what he wants. It's been interesting just, you know, journeying with Jesus over more years. My prayers get answered more often these days. Why? Because I'm super spiritual and so wonderful? Well, maybe. But, <laughs> kidding. <laughs> no, because as Jesus has changed my heart to be more and more like his heart, my prayers line up with his will more and more. So, of course, he can answer them. That's what this is saying. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you, so you will be my disciples. With all the shaking of my head, I've managed to get a hair in my eye. Okay. Jesus keeps underlying the same thing. Abide in my love. Uh, it is in here. In this short section, it is there ten times. And love is in this section between John 14, 15 and John 15, 17, uh, 15 times. So, what do you think he wants to talk about? Love and abiding. <laughs> and those go together. So it's over and over and over. And he says, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Wow. The way God the Father loves Jesus, and you can imagine, he's pretty crazy about him, because they're God. They're both the same equal quality God. That's how Jesus loves his disciples. Abide in my love. So abide in me, abide in the word, do what I say, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus isn't asking from us something different than he's asking from himself. The Father loves me, and he's asking me to lay down my life for you all. I'm obeying him. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. These things I've spoken to you, he says, that my joy may remain in you. Stay, abide. That your, my joy, which isn't happiness, which is just joy, the ability to be joyful in the midst of whatever, will stay in you and that your joy may be full. And the word full is like a cup that's filled to the brim. You cannot carry it now because you will spill. It's that full. That's how full and Jesus wants to pour us with joy. How do we get there? By abiding in his love. When you know that you know that you know that the God of the universe loves you that much, you can just relax and, in, and enjoy and rejoice. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Have we heard this before? We started with that. See, he is serious. He is really trying to drill this in their heads. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. It's that whatever word that tripped me up last night. <laughs> okay, well, I don't always do that. No longer do I call your servant, you servants because a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. I need you to get this, he says, because it's going to get uncomfortable. He goes into, then he tells them, just so you know, just like the world hated me, the world's going to hate you. Just because you love me and abide in my love and keep my commandments and stay in the word and you are full of joy, we kind of think, oh, cool, life will be a snap. No. Because <laughs> the world hated Jesus. These are the people that didn't understand, that didn't want to listen, that didn't want to hear his word, that didn't want to be transformed. They hated him. And just like the world hated him, if you belong to him, the world's going to hate you. So if you feel like the, you and the world don't get along very well, that is the best news for you, honestly. Because there's this interesting quote I read in one of the commentaries. No one is more miserable than the Christian who, has, who for a time hedges in his obedience. He does not love sin enough to enjoy its pleasures. That's the darn thing about being a Christian. You don't love sin quite as much as you used to before you became a Christian. So he or she doesn't love sin enough to enjoy its pleasures. So you're really not enjoying it like you used to. 
and does not love Christ enough to relish holiness. So you're not having the party you want, and you don't love Jesus enough to, to count it all joy. He perceives that his rebellion is iniquitous, but obedience seems distasteful. So he doesn't think his rebellion is that bad, but it's not as pleasurable. But he does, the idea of obeying is even more distasteful. He does not feel at home any longer in the world, but his memory of his past associations and the tantalizing lyrics of his old music prevent him from singing with the saints. Meaning, you remember how great it was. And isn't that like in, in the addiction communities that we deal with, we remember how cool getting drunk or getting high was or how fun that party was. Or, and in, in the days where we struggle or maybe we're being pruned and Christianity doesn't seem all that fun, we longingly can look back to how great it used to be. And we, um, what do you call that? Glorify it. You glorify your old sinful life because right now you're not as happy and you're stuck. So that's what they're saying. It's the worst place to be. This is a, a person must, uh, most pitied because they c can't forever be ambivalent. It's a good thing for us to think about. It, you have two choices. I mean, you have a choice. You either stay in the vine or you don't stay in the vine. If you stay in the vine, you're supposed to produce fruit. If you're producing fruit, the world's going to hate you. There's a cost. But the joy in that is so much greater. We don't have to fear. Or you can choose never for Jesus. The world won't hate you. But oh boy, are you going to have a surprise. There will be no dwelling places prepared for you. <laughs> this is not a good choice. Or you are the Christian that tries to straddle the fence. You want enough of the world because it's cool and hip and fun or it seems fun because you don't want to be one of those holy rollers. But you're not enjoying that anymore. You're not enjoying the world anymore. But you don't want to be like those people. You know, you don't want to have to pay, pay the price. This is no way to live. And Jesus himself says, hot or cold, people, hot or cold. Lukewarm he spits out. He doesn't say it in those words exactly in Revelation, but it does say that. We have to choose. I say choose joy. <laughs> so what were the disciples experiencing at that time? Can you imagine? You, you've just, you know, he's leaving. Don't worry. I've got a place for you. It's going to be great. Father and me are going to live in you and you and us, and we're going to abide, and you'll be wonderful. The world's going to hate you, by the way. Great. <laughs> but how does this apply to us? Isn't that the same place we're in? It's the same place we're in, right? How tempting is it? Well, I know some of us poo-poo, you know, are annoyed by the goings-on, but a lot of people are getting whipped up with the fear of the COVID-19, right? How tempting is it to let the world influence us? Well, we don't have to, just like the disciples didn't have to. Jesus made it clear what he wanted them and us to know, and here's what that is. He says, you did not choose me. Why is that important? Disciples always chose their rabbi. That's not how it happened with Jesus. He specifically chose the 12 he wanted. But I chose you. And why? And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. In your everyday ordinary life, Christ follower, you are meant to grow fruit. Your life should start to change. You should grow in your relationship with Jesus. You should grow in your knowledge, in your obedience. You should grow in um, influencing others. You know, fruit isn't just something that grows naturally from a healthy vine, and it's yummy for eating, but when it falls to the ground, it reproduces, right? So a Christ follower that bears fruit is also starting to invest in others and you can see fruit. And that your fruit should remain, not here today, gone tomorrow, but something lasting. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. This is all part of love, abiding, and fruit bearing, this not being given what you ask for. These things I command you, that you love one another. I mean, these two verses kind of encapsulate the entire thing we've been talking about. And Jesus chooses you, and he ha and my question is, have you chosen him? 
You remember the three choices, all in, which is ultimately the great life. Not at all in, which will maybe a party down here, but it's eternity of suffering or that straddling place. If you want to say yes to Jesus, three steps. Admit you need God and turn from your sins. Then believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for your, on the cross, paid for your sins, and rose again. I heard somebody say, there's lots of people who die for other people. The American soldier or soldiers all over the world do that all the time. It's not dying. That's the answer. It's that he rose to life again. And then invite Jesus Christ to come into your life forever, as Savior and Lord. If this is you, pray with me. If you want to say yes to Jesus today, pray this following prayer with me. If you've done this before, just recommit. Maybe take that next step of saying, I am actually going to be all in and become a person who is a commandment keeper. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I ask you to forgive me and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior in your name. Amen. And Jesus, thank you that you modeled what you're talking about, that you loved us, and that loving meant keeping the Father's commandments, and that you, that you remained in God's love and in his word and in his being, and that you are wanting to do the same with us. Will you help us to not just feel love for you or want to feel love for you, but would you help us to actually love you by obeying your commandments? Would you help us to live as Christ followers? Would you help us to take that next step to become more like you? In Jesus' name, amen.